the Swedish president out of the way. I would like to call the Prime Minister to open the semi-final debate. As the world's preeminent superpower, we'd quite like to remain that way and enjoy our power even more. We think that we want to continue the Monroe Doctrine, the long-standing rule that the US will basically get to determine what happens in South America. We want to continue and expand that. We think this policy will be in the US's best interest. What is our policy going to be? Few things. Firstly, this is obviously going to be a discretionary policy. We're not going to do this all the time in exactly the same way. Rather, it will depend on two specific factors. Firstly, it depends on how left-wing the government is, right? If the government is fairly middling but slightly left-wing, we might interfere a bit less. If it's very left-wing, a la Cuba, we'll interfere quite a lot. Secondly, the extent to which we interfere depends on whether or not we can do it well in a covert way. So if it's obvious they're going to win by like an 80% landslide, maybe it's not worth us doing it. But if it's a marginal election, 55%, 51%, 49%, we might interfere to, make, interfere to make it certain that we're going to win. Secondly, we're going to point out that this is obviously a debate from the perspective of what's in the interests of the US, it's an actor-specific motion, rather than about humanitarian aims or the rights of people in general. Thirdly, we think that we can actually do this effectively. I'll talk about that in a moment. So, three points of substantive. Firstly, what are the US interests? Secondly, why we think we can do this effectively. And thirdly, why we think left-wing governments are generally very bad for the US interests. Firstly, therefore, what are the US's interests in the region? The first is trade. The US formed NAFTA because it realized it needed access to one of the biggest growing sources of demand in the world right now to ensure that producers in the US can employ people and add to the GDP and make the US more prosperous. Secondly, the US is also interested in regional stability. By what, what do I mean when I say stability? I mean, we do not want to have crises between the rich and the poor. We do not want revolutionary movements coming into power that cause large amounts of immigrants flooding from one country to another as happened in Cuba, that causes a lot of problems for us in terms of immigration policy. Also, stability is good for growth, which benefits us because we can trade with them more. Thirdly, we have a broad interest in them having the same sort of capitalist values as we do. It makes it easier to negotiate trade deals, makes it easier to open borders. We think, for instance, it's important that they have a basic regime of property rights, or we can never gain meaningful economic integration with them. So those, in short, are the US's interests. Secondly, why do we think that we can do this policy effectively, apart from the fact that this is going to be discretionary, which we think itself is quite good? Firstly, this is obviously going to be a long-term plan. One of the consequences of the Cold War is that the US, even today, maintains a very large network of deeply embedded agents who are often personal advisors to important South American leaders, right? We know about this because documents from the Cold War have now been declassified, and we know that we have been doing that for a very long time. Now, we are only going to declassify our operations here long into the future when different governments are in place, and they don't particularly care about this. But note, secondly, no thank you, these governments are so corrupt, so opaque, so difficult to have any kind of meaningful check on in the very first place, and that it's very difficult to differentiate one kind of corruption that's from the US from any other kind of corruption from the cronies or from the mafia, no thank you, or from criminals. In other words, basically, it's so hard to tell what exactly the US is doing, we don't think it will make that much of a difference. So we think we can do this effectively. Even if we get found out, we think it'll be extremely rare, so the benefits still fall on our side of the house, and we don't think the world can do very much against us because we're a nuclear power, we're in the P5, we're really great, they can't really sanction us or do anything to meaningfully hurt us. No, thank you. Why is it therefore that left-wing governments are terrible for our interests? Five reasons. Number one, we think that left-wing governments generally decrease trade. They are not pro-open borders. Why is that the case? Because left-wing governments are generally pro-worker, right? They are for the working man. They listen to workers' conglomerates that do not want to be outcompeted by US industries that are more efficient, can work better, can flood their markets of higher quality goods. That's why Michel Bachelet in Chile led to a decrease in trade with the US by over 20% in basic goods, right? That's bad for us. We do not want left-wing governments that cut down trade in this manner. Note, furthermore, it's also not the case, even if they want to talk about the interests of people in Chile, I'll take you in a moment, that this is good for them because people in Chile need access to cheap goods goods as well. And the point to which the US can supply them with these goods that domestic industries can't, we think actually the people there benefit. Though that's quite secondary. Go ahead. Hypothetically, if US becomes a pro-left, will don't you think US government will manipulate even their own elections and therefore occur to their own democracy? No, because that's not a policy, so we're not doing it. <laughs> Secondly, therefore, why is it uh, these left-wing governments are very bad? 
Left-wing governments tend to want to nationalize large industries, especially important industries to the government, in order to maintain control over them and again to make some kind of guarantee of worker security. In other words, the government tends to become the major controller of not only like industry but also things like education and tries to provide education for everyone. This is incredibly bad. Often governments are weak and corrupt and sclerotic, don't have the expertise to manage these things effectively. That often means that you drive away large amounts of investment that will help these economies grow and will mean that they can trade more stuff with us and mean and mean that our citizens can get the benefit of their goods as well, right? So, example, Salvador Sanchez Ceres in El Salvador. Again, tried to nationalize large industry. Now they're failing, where before there was steady growth of 5% in El Salvador before. That's bad for us if their economy fails. Thirdly, these governments are often full of corruption and cronyism. Why? Because left-wing governments try to position themselves to become the major actor in the country to not only provide for economic goods, but also things like healthcare and education. But because these governments are so corrupt, often they can't provide effective education, they can't provide effective healthcare. There is one prominent exception to the rule. That is Cuba. No, in Cuba, the only way they've been able to secure these things is by brutally cracking down on anyone who opposes them and creating huge social instability in the process. So the one example of where the governments are good at providing them with education and healthcare, which might be good for us, right? An educated, well-working populist means that we can get more economic benefits from trading with them, obviously, right? So they don't even provide most of the, these goods all of the time. And left-wing governments are especially prone to cronyism because they want to control as many things as possible. So a corrupt government means that their corruption feeds into many other areas of the country. Whereas a less left-wing government is less likely to control these things. Corruption and cronyism are less likely to have an impact because the free market and individual who are less, like, you know, incompetent, I suppose, are in charge of these things. Um, fourthly, left-wing governments tend to be unsustainable because they play up rich poor tensions. No, left-wing movements in South America are not like left-wing movements in the UK or the Norway. They're not nice, they're not very conciliatory. They're uniquely revolutionary because of links in the Cold War and the ideologies that, that inspired them. That means that often left-wing governments come to power and have programs against the rich. They try to collectivize things and take away the property of the rich. That's incredibly bad for us in terms of trade, no one's left to run the industries, and also in terms of stability. Fourthly, lastly, fifthly, um, often these governments are unsustainable because of things like debt, right? Look, 1970s, 1980s, Argentina had like 20 times more debt than it had a GDP. When governments become so weak, and when it comes to the short term, they turn down to cracking down on individuals and people who try to stand against them. They might start out democratic. Left-wing governments rarely stay democratic because the moment they try to implement a revolutionary agenda, people stand out against them and they crack down on these individuals. Instability is formed. That's incredibly bad for the US government. Because this is going to be very good for the US, because we didn't even do it in a world, we are very proud to propose. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to explain why U.S. shouldn't do this and what are the long-term uh, implications for United States of America. But before that, I'm going to have three points of rebuttal. First of all, what we hear from the first government, they say the U.S. doesn't take any harm from this. They see only the benefits. First of all, we believe that uh, he's saying even if world discover we manipulate those choices, we are too too big for the rest of the world. We are too powerful. We believe that's not true, especially today. United States are not so powerful as 20 years ago. There are m many countries that are strong or economic or in military way. We have Russia, which is military strong. We have China, wh who is economically strong and gets a bigger a bigger army every day, we have European Union, we have Brazil, etc. We believe that if we are, as United States, portray ourselves as someone who is uh, who is manipulating those elections, we believe that our soft power is going to be even lower today. What does that mean? Why this bad? Because the perception of common people, perception of common people, they don't trust the United States. They want, they don't want jobs to, to work, to co cooperate with the United States. We believe because we will have that so lowerance of soft power, it will hurt the United States very well, especially international relationships, because 
of dot untrust. But I am going to deal even if we have some magic, if if we have magic and we can stall all, the, we can manipulate all those elections and nothing change in my constructive material. Second thing to rebuttal. Uh, main problem with those countries in South and Central America is because they're corrupt, we, can, ca we can't have the economic, rela economic relationships with, between them. And because we impose democracy and impose our values, they say, okay, now it will be better. No, it won't be better. Let's take the example of Serbia. We, we had switched from the socialism to democracy. And what happens there? We still have the same problems with the corruption because of cultural differences. Those countries are not as the same as the United States. They, those, those countries have their own values. What, what are the values of the United States which are different? They believe in their governments. In those countries like Serbia and similar South America, they don't have trust in those governments. Those people who are there, they are looking only for themselves because politicians are not people who are rich and try to try to help the rest of the world, you go into politics to get rich and be, get even more power. We believe that's major differences and because of that we'll, they will still be corrupted. And uh, what is he saying? We, there isn't any way to change those left wings. Final thing to rebuttal. We believe that we have alternatives. We believe that if, especially the United States, because we are promoter of democracy, the main promoter of democracy in the world, we believe that we should do it slowly. We will believe that we can we, based on our soft power, based on our other hard power, we have a strong economy. Those countries are there, they don't have much, uh, much countries to trade with. They have to trade with Brazil, Argentina, and United States. Those are big economies. We can, Uslovity. Uh, we can condition them. Because of that, we're a strong economy. We don't need to manipulate those choices because that manipulation will uh, long term affect even us. And that is the that is reflection on my POI. Because he said this is not a policy. But what is the problem? If government gets away from this, they will look at it as a policy. If we see that we can manipulate elections somewhere and never find out why we shouldn't do implement the same policies in the United States if we become pro-left wing. It's not because the uh, whole debate is a bit uh, in the long term. We should think even if uh, you, United States becomes pro-left wing. And now my, my constructive material. Okay. First, first scenario that can happen if somebody finds out. Because it's hard to manipulate elections, a lot of people are involved, we think there is a big chance to find out. We believe that we'll have backlash, we'll have a chaos in those countries. We believe that because the rhetoric of the left wing is America is evil, they manipulate us, they use us. Now we'll give even legitimacy for those left wings to, uh, to uh, legitimacy to talk like that. We believe because and because this is true, more people are going to believe them. More moderate people are going to the left wing. They're not and moderate people are the most important people because we must affect them. Second thing, why if this finds out, how is this reflect on other countries? We believe we want to picture America as a perfect democracy, but America has its limits. We believe that those countries also like in South America and Central America are going to be the picture of uh, of United States and because they are because uh, they are manipulating the elections of other states we are perpetuating that mechanism to other states and other states will start implementing that same uh, same that same policy so we believe that in the long term with all those countries doing the same thing it's inherently bad and morally bad because America has its own standards. Maybe they want, uh, they think this is inherently good, but because of cultural differences, we believe that those countries may do this in some other way which is, is not inherently good, only because they see it's uh, America ca has got away with it and they think they will fight with democracy and they will manipulate all other things. Second thing, let's imagine that we have a magic, magic wand, and we'll say, okay, we'll change elections. Nobody finds out. Only the government knows. Why, why is that inherently bad? But if, before I continue, yes, to you. How come in Chile we didn't have a totally against America response to America invading and you know, checking their elections, but we had a more developing economy until a socialist one came up again? Uh, uh, sorry, socially? Sorry, how come Chile did not so have the massive backlash against America? Well, we believe that Maybe in Chile it's true, but we're talking about more countries. Chile is not the only country. We believe because other countries may implement that major backlash. 
Uh, so I'm going to continue why, even if it's that, that is true, I'm going to show why is this bad for the United States. We believe this is anti-democratic. We believe that government will know it. We believe that democracy is our way, way of living, our sacred value. We believe that our foreign policy is a foreign policy who protects democracy. We promote it. We believe that we are going to betray our people, our values, our constitution if we do this. Why is this bad? You are not morally consistent. You, this policy could hurt your future decisions. And now I'm going to get to that moment even if we are US become pro-left wing. We do the same thing to our people. We diminish democracy within sight. US becomes that what is she fighting against. We believe this will be bad for democracy in the long term because if we get away with this, we are going to even manipulate even our people because of some values that we don't think is democratic. Because of all that, I beg you to oppose. Thank you. I thought I would stand here defending the scourge, I suppose, of US imperialism, but I will, and I love it. <laughs> what I'm going to do is point out to you two things. Number one, explain to you what happens in Central and Latin American countries when left-wing governments come into power. And second of all, explain how checking that progress is necessarily in American interest. And along the way, I'll respond to all the material that we heard from our opposition. First of all, what happens in left-wing countries in Southern and Central America? And bear in mind this is an aspect of analysis of Ashish's that we never really got a response to. Bear in mind that left-wing governments in these countries are quite different in terms of the constitution of ideological history. Why is that? Because they were heavily influenced by the Cold War as satellite states, as the Russians attempted to spread their ideology all around these places. What does this mean? Take for instance Nicaragua in the 1970s, which had an extremely left-wing government tendencies towards collectivization. This ideological baggage has translated to the modern day, which is why the nature of their dialogue is of a very different kind. How different? Bear in mind that unlike Western left-wing thought, your presumption here is that capitalism is necessarily evil. You begin from the presumption of the virtue of Marxism, and you're trying to then mitigate and accommodate certain aspects of maybe free trade, for example. What then? It is much more intensely focused on the idea of class warfare, that the bourgeois has robbed us of all our property rights but for labor. It is also intensely focused on the hardcore collectivization that characterizes so much of Venezuelan politics and so much of Cuban politics. It is also focused very heavily on emotional anti-capitalist rhetoric. We want to get rid of the rich man that has taken over all our ideas. Sometimes it even intersects with ethnic politics, something that I'll go on to when I talk about Bolivia a little bit later. The point here is, instead of attempting to mitigate for the harms of capitalism and therefore create a much more moderate brand of left-wing, uh, um, sorry, left-wing thought and Marxist government, you have a far more intense and far more left-wing version of that emerging in Southern America. And that's the thing the United States is afraid of. Why are we afraid? First of all, because it's non a non-functional and incredibly unsustainable form of government. Bear in mind that you're very heavily focused on having the state collectivize industry after industry after industry. The big problem with this is, of course, that governments are typically not very good at running private industries, which is why when Venezuela took over their oil industry, it dropped in productivity over the course of Chavez's regime by well over 50%. Yeah. Argentina, no thank you sir, when it attempted to nationalize Kaiser Steel in the 80s, not only destroyed Kaiser Steel, but also collapsed their entire economy. The second reason why this is extremely dangerous is because they take on a lot of debt. When you have a massive central government, you need to start spending on all sorts of different things, which again means you need to start borrowing in order to subsidize oil, for example, or in order to make sure that you can provide incredibly horrible services, or at the very bare minimum, make sure you make, uh, keep your cronies happy. What's the problem with this? Unlike the United States of America, these people cannot infinitely borrow. Someone will want that money back eventually, right? This is why every single successful country in the world that has ever moved out of its developing stage phase, like China, like Vietnam, the Asian Tigers, in fact, Brazil, even within in South America have decided to move towards a form of spending that is not so intensely focused on left-wing economic thought. This is therefore patently economically unsustainable. What does this mean? No, thank you, sir. It means that your economy will eventually collapse, and I'll explain how this is terrible for stability for the United States, although that seems somewhat self-evident anyway. 
We told you also about why having a massive state apparatus makes it much more likely that cronyism and corruption emerges in that state apparatus. Their response was all, it will exist anyway because these countries are poor and these countries have corrupt politicians. Every country is corrupt politicians. For the specific purpose of economics in this case, we're going to venture the argument that the specific type of cronyism that emerges in free market capitalist states is of a very different type. When you have a, cap uh, sorry, a left wing Marxist style government, which is a massive state apparatus, the vast majority of cronies you have will literally be people you pay and people you control with the force of law, for example. What's the problem with that? It means that the nature of that capitalism is that they're not partners, they're not capable of independent enterprise. Whereas if you contrast it with the sorts of capitalists that emerge, for example, or are cronies rather, that emerge in far more free market capitalist states. They tend to be rich businessmen who are on equal footing and capable of running their own private industries. The sort of cronyism and corruption, therefore, is economically productive, even if much more of the money goes towards them than everybody else, which frankly the US doesn't care about. It doesn't care about the equity of these Central American states, it cares about economic sustainability. In other words, the version of crony capitalism that arrived from the the version of corruption that emerges in their world is significantly more dangerous for the economic sustainability of the country than our version. No, thank you, sir, if you can say such a thing of capitalism, uh, of, of cronyism, right? Why then is this particular picture of left-wing politics in South America, no thank you sir, especially dangerous for American interests? Number one, because as I pointed out, these countries eventually collapse, right? When these countries eventually become poor and incapable of protecting their people as they promised, there's massive not just economic instability, but political instability. What's the big danger about this? Because you've trumped up so much class warfare and because you've intersected this class warfare invariably with many aspects of ethnic politics, when rich people tend to belong to a very specific minority white class, for example, you get massive violence emerging in the country, which, you know, thank you, sir, is exactly what happened in the wake of economic crises in Indonesia and Bolivia within that particular continent that you want to talk about. That's the first danger that creates massive instability that inhibits trade with a huge, potentially growing market that the USA can interact with. Second of all, they hate trade. Hang a moment there, man. If they hate trade, they're not going to talk to the US, and not just talk to the US, but in being incapable of negotiating trade deals, for example, that the United States might want to emerge to create easier access to those markets, for instance. Okay. Yes, madam. So your solution for this problem is basically to put upon the tradition of the socialistic states that the, the Latin America was at once, at once upon a time, to impose some Western values on them and hope that it won't backlash on the people who didn't want that in the first place by whirling the socialistic parties up till now, so you're imposing something which is not theirs on them. Yes. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Their claim about trust and cooperation, right? They say we will hate the US government. And then therefore it compromises a soft power. Assumption number one, you will find out, which as Ashish has pointed out and that you've not responded to is very difficult to do. But second of all, they will hate the US government. They might hate Obama, they might hate Bush, they might hate anyone who comes to the power next, but they won't hate US culture. Why? Because Gossip Girl and Justin Bieber are excellent arbiters and wonderful things that everybody in the world wants to buy. Second of all, even if people hate us, I really honestly do not care. Why is that? Because if my interest is to negotiate a trade deal with you and get you to listen to me, I don't need to talk to your people. All I need to do is talk to your government. And given that backlash, as you so speak, is not going to be able to vote in a government that is antithetical to our interests because we're going to manipulate your elections anyway, it honestly makes no difference on a pragmatic utilitarian calculation. And third of all, again, bear in mind the history of, these, uh, of South America and their politics, right? Many of these countries are used to American interference in the continent already because of the Monroe Doctrine, because the USA, or rather, the USA treats much of Latin America as part of its backyard. In other words, these countries tend already to be very used to anti-American rhetoric. So at the very bare minimum, the change that you impose is very minimal. There's not going to be a sudden massive backlash just because they've already been doing this for an extremely long time. Their last point is that other countries will do this. One, the United States is bigger than all of you and will do it better. Second, so what? Not many people want left-wing governments in power anyway. If China comes in, they will probably run a right-wing government. I am very proud to oppose, ah, to oppose this motion. <laughs> Yes, sir, we care about our citizens and we care about the U.S. interest, but what we 
cannot agree is that it is that we cannot care about the people of these countries because caring about people in these countries directly influences the US interest and I'll tell you why okay most of my rebuttal will be integrated into my constructive I'll try to flag it as best as possible but let's first talk about the alternatives and how they haven't engaged at all with our analysis on why this is bad and, and on what are better ways to do this so these are what the alternatives are there is are these are small countries so basically they we can get them to be economically dependent on us this is an alternative we can trade them once we trade we also share export a part of our values with a part of our products bit by bit they need credits they'll take them from us we can condition after but it's going to be based on their rhetoric not on our rhetoric and it's not going to feel imposed so why do we think this is better because hey we don't have no backlash not even a risk of a backlash whether they find out or not find out we're doing it step by step it's a slower change therefore there means there's no shock effect even if they don't find out about this like uh, like uh, Stella perfectly asked in her POI what happens when you have these traditionally left-wing uh, oriented people even if they we have this magic and we get them to be right-wing right now and they don't find that we explicitly did it as the US government they're still gonna feel a massive change and it's gonna be a shock effect it's going to be terrible no sir all right now let me uh, expand more on these alternatives on what which are better so the, the the change must come from within even if we do this magically and they have no clue that the US government actually officially tampered with the democratic results of the election which is horrible in itself Pablo already told you why this morally endangers us I'll deepen that uh, uh, no sir so <clears throat> uh, why does the change have to come from within it just has to because these people have a completely different mindset completely different set of values First of all, their identity, their Latin American identity has been massively built up uh, on based on this resistance to the U.S. imperialism. And the U.S. imperialism is not necessarily seen as a direct policy of the U.S. policymakers, but their values, their capitalistic values. Why? Because their capitalistic values are inherently very liberal and very individualistic oriented compared to the Latin American identity, which is collectivized, which is very collective. So once they they see this once they see the uh, once they see that these values are now suddenly coming into it even if they don't know that they, or nobody knows that this was actually being tampered with the shock effect is going to be massive and people will not necessarily know and, uh, and and people are necessarily yeah people are not necessarily going to know how to function in this society which directly tackles the whole thing with uh, with uh, with their with their uh, left wing governments being full of corruption how how so they say we prefer the free market corruption to the left wing corruption why because all of a sudden now uh, we have these rich businessmen who are actually capable of running their own enterprise so even if like 90 percent of the money is basically funneled to the dirty politicians and these businessmen you know the people will still get 10 percent which is magically more productive than the left-wing government left-wing way of governance however we see this is very bad and this is detrimentally bad pernicious effects on the people's opinion because we have these rich people who are going to essentially become oligarchs they're gonna see that they can manipulate uh, the markets there why because why are they going to be able to manipulate these markets because a lack of uh, co consumerism and consumeristic culture and capitalistic values a lack of lack of adjustment to the market the market is not ready okay uh, the market is not ready for this shock and now once this happened and we have these businessmen taking initiatives starting the corruption people are going to feel the consequences economically because of this corruption and no checks and balances from the US are going to be able to fix this once this weak market is being uh, put in a position where uh, several people can establish oligarchy and then uh, through a corruptive government uh, uh, basically uh, a, a lot of people are not going to be able to experience the benefits experience the benefits of this uh, uh, of this uh, capitalism we're offering them where is now the final impact to that? Why is that terribly wrong for USA? It's wrong because when people see from outside that we have a US supported model, economic model, and we see that people are massively unsatisfied with it, we see that people aren't reaping the benefits of it as it's supposed to, but only the majority on the top, the rich, or the rich oligarchs, then such model loses its credibility, such model loses its acceptance, such model is less likely to actually be accepted in no. 
to actually be accepted in the long run. And we think this is detrimentally bad for the US interest because then even if nobody knows, and though we have WikiLeaks so, and all these other whistleblowers, it's almost certain that in the age of information technology, it's almost certain that this is by no means a long-term viable strategy. This again to, to flag is the answer to their long-term plan. They, they rely on these documents being published 50 years from now. Well, we say there will be a Snowden, there will be, there will be a, a Julian Assange who will publish them. It's gonna hurt you badly. Even if people don't know it, it's still gonna hurt you badly because I explained that people will not reap the benefits so outsiders are gonna see that this is not yielding results that you guys have wanted what do you say to that so uh, if what you're saying about inequality is true why hasn't Brazil collapsed uh, why hasn't Brazil collapsed? The fact that it hasn't collapsed doesn't mean that it, uh, it isn't going to collapse. You have massive inequality there. You have people in favelas being severely underprivileged. Are you seriously going to stand here and defend that people in oh, Brazil are better off for their economic model? Wouldn't say so. Also, to target uh, the second government's POI about the Pinochet. So, my partner already told you, but uh, this is what happened, is that people did severely protest the persecution because Pinochet may have brought some economic stability uh, in some point but what happened is there were massive persecution massive people oppression people did not reap the benefits of it people have protested demanding the extradition of Pinochet and Thatcher so UK and US supported him and therefore lost a part of its credibility there so again it backfired on them I've told you that in the age of information technology we can't rely on secrecy like that and even if we magically could the shock doc the shock effect that's gonna impact the people is that the, the market will still be corrupted because it's unadopted people are not consumeristic they're not going to be able to reap these benefits benefits will go to the oligarchs and what happens when outsiders see this the rest of Central America they're gonna think no we do not want this this is not working even if the US wants it even if it's legitimately there but it's not we don't want it so for these reasons we beg you to oppose this motion Let's face it, the socialist revolution has died. When we have a lifetime of Chavez and the people in the poorest, like in the poorest level of the country do not improve their lifestyle because of Chavez's policy, we have to ask ourselves, are those people better off? When we have uh, a legacy of Chile, which without Pinochet could actually make policies which improved it, not improving. When we have a legacy of Brazil having slums, not improving by themselves, it is hard to stand on their side and say, uh, we don't want America because it's not in the best interest of the people who are working there, let alone in the interest of America. So that argument doesn't fall on their side. But what we're going to tell you is, we're going to take this interest of America and take it even further on. Because they say to us, there's going to be a backlash and therefore less trading with America. Well, what we have seen is that doesn't really happen. We're still trading with Chile in other ways. This is what the first proposition said. Look, we don't care what the people think in themselves. What we care about is what we actually can make trade agreements. And we're going to tell you another level of how this is going to help us in the long term. It's because usually when people live in socialist countries and live in poverty for the majority of the population, they never develop an apparatus in which they could be critical towards their governments because they buy into the strong ideology that criticism cannot happen and they don't overthrow their governments as such because they think, oh, socialism is good. But once you open trade and you open yourself for more development and you get more money, which means you sponsor education, you also educate people more to be more constructive and more critical of certain approaches, which means you're making them better via trade. So you might not like the cure today, but it's going to help you on a long term, so this is why we need you to take the pill. Yes, Milan. How come it didn't help any of the countries that we tried and support, and then we had them dropping off for their people to be revolted after we did that? I'm not quite sure which ones you're referring to. You're free to explain what exactly you want and explain the mechanism which is going to be linked there. But fine, bring it, whatever. Okay. Um, 
So the next big idea they have is about this idea of finding out and you know the repercussions of finding out. But we're going to tell you why this is actually good on a bigger scale. Because we're not interested just in the short term uh, interest which America gets from having this trade and having these governments and having these policies. What we're interested in is America on the international field. Because they're constantly bringing us this, this idealistic position that the socialist government are finally going to you know, finish the Bolivar Revolution and something's going to happen. Or that other superpowers are not going to intervene. Because what we agree on with the first opposition is America America is losing in terms of power worldwide. And I think that, that is very dangerous, especially with these countries in Southern and Central America. Here we go to our extension, which is the concept of hegemony as we know it. So why is hegemony so important in order to keep it up, right? Because the ideal world is trying to propose is every country for themselves, every country respects each other, but it's not the real politics which we see. We see that a lot of countries are trying to foster their interests in one way or another. America already fosters its interest, and I think they would be fine with it, by spreading NGO, uh, financing opposition, financing certain, right? A lot of things, right? So you spread your foreign policy in a lot of tools. But there are other countries which do not use the same tools as America. For example, we have the expansionism of Russia, which is done mostly in a military and also a cultural way. We have the expansionism of China, which introduces, which introduces very harsh forms of capitalism, as we have seen in Africa, and we do not find it very acceptable. So if you want to argue for the idealistic world where America is not going to intervene, you also have to argue in the long term what is going to happen if America doesn't intervene and lets the socialist countries implement their ideological policies and cement their ideological policies even further in comparison to other powers, the other superpowers gaining power, right? Because what do we see? When there is not a clear hegemon, a clear ruler of the world, it happens that hegemons compete between themselves. We have seen it in the time of the Cold War and what are the consequences of that? As first, there is a loss of diplomatic ties which are not beneficial either for America or for anybody else. As second, there is a loss of economic ties as, as well because you polarize the world to put it in different camps. Why is this specific for Central and um, Southern America for a very specific reason. They have the ideology of Marxism and Communism which actually ties them to China and Russia in certain respects and we think that countries might actually develop trade or diplomatic agreement with those countries therefore either fostering each other's economy at the expense of America's in the first place or each other's diplomatic ties or each other's legitimacy within the world as this being a legitimate paradigm through which you can run a country even though this is not a socialist government it's an elitistic government which takes away from the people but is trying to reveal what they're doing within that because there's not people who would be critical because they're not investing and not developing fast enough as they would under a capitalistic model. So what is happening if you develop these other superpowers which are competing against America? Because the world might be idealistic but we take the real stance here. It means that we're going to have more consequences of, uh, the, of uh, several superpowers trying to compete for the position of hegemony. And we have seen what that has happened in the past. So losing economic ties not in the interest of America or anybody else. Losing economic ties not in the interest of America or anybody else. Spreading the ideology that socialism which is just a veal for elite governments which corrupt and take away from the people for shame on you being from the Balkans <laughs> and not knowing how this works um, take it from the people but using it as a legitimate tool to stop development within their own people and even more what we see is proxy wars and we think that it's very dangerous as such. We already see Russia trying to have expansionistic tensions towards Ukraine. We have seen Afghanistan in the time of Cold War when Russia and America have been on par when it comes to hegemonic power and competing for them. So if we have an America which is falling, we want an America which gets stronger. And this is something which might implement them. And here is what the analysis we're going to use from the first table. If we have stronger trade, if we have ideology which goes on our side and more countries which buy into our ideology and therefore spread our block of ideology, we think America is actually better off and actually helps them being this hegemony superpower which we want. And on the long term, this actually prevents a lot of bad consequences and bad effects in terms of superpowers fighting with each other. Pablo. Okay, but you're, trying, you're comparing this to Russia, but Russia is spreading his, his culture so aggressively. That is the reason people don't like it and don't trust them. Same thing will happen with the United States. We don't think aggression is the only reason why I accept or deny a culture. We think ideological, ideological boundaries, which is part of the argumentation you used, and the compatibility of ideological boundaries is something which makes you trade with others, but specifically usually are not the people, but the people who govern a specific country which make those ties, so your argumentation is irrelevant. But what is more important here, even the danger of finding out actually goes on our side. Because if it becomes more clear that America is the one who takes its own and makes itself stronger, it is a warning of other superpowers do not meddle in our affairs we will do whatever we want in order to stay at the position in which we are the strongest one. And we think that message has to be sent to an expansionistic China which
which uses corrupt forms of capitalism and abuses people. That message has to be sent to a Russia which doesn't care about the sovereignty of the countries. Because one thing is to change slightly the election results, the other thing is not caring completely about the concept of sovereignty and thinking of yourself as a better one. If we have to choose between two devils, we have to choose for the ones which we know and thus less damage. And because we are, we are realistic on our self side and not idealistic and buying into the socialist revolution which never happened and never succeeded, this is the reason why on a long term and not just today, on the concept of hegemony and international politics, you have to pass this motion. Thank you. Too many things I have to cover in this speech after this pernicious intrusion of neo-colonialism from the side of the God, right? A uh, couple of things I want to discuss. Firstly, whoever read The Good Samaritan knows that they're talking about the economy and they're talking about how they're doing that for people of those countries is bollocks, right? After their national nationalization of industry in Argentina, when the Argentina entered NAFTA, only because they didn't allow them to subsidize their industry, their industry fell down. And that was also intrusion of the USA, right? Because they're taking away their industries and they're saying, oh, they're entering the free market, you have to open your market for us and our big companies and our big industries to take over everything and take your cheap labor so you can live worse off. So they're not doing it for them, right? But this debate is not about that. This debate about, is about the interest of the USA, right? So we're not going to be uh, off track. I want to talk to you about several things. I want to talk to you about the development of the left wing, uh, left wing in South and Central America. I want to talk to you about those people and I want to talk to you about the perception of USA. And thirdly, I will talk to, uh, talk to you about moral doctrine and long-term interest. Before that, a couple of points of rebuttal, right? These guys from the opening up come here and they're like, Ooh, look, uh, there's a corruption here. There, there's a corruption all over the place. There's a corruption everywhere, right? That's what the, you admitted from the side of the government. Why is it different whether or not the corrupted politicians are left or right wing or central wing, right? Why is that, does it make difference to you? But if you're not fighting corruption, no. They want to be on the same side as mafia, as they said, because they're, they're corrupting their governments the same way. They want to rig, rig the elections. That's exactly the same thing that they want to do. But on morally thing, we're not saying that everywhere there is corruption, right? We have Uruguay, who has the poorest president in the world. Right? And it works, work, works fine there. So not all the countries are the same. But let's see what, we, what are we talking about. Right? When, we say that, uh, when they say uh, from, from, from the side of the guard right, that the, they have to enter free market to be better because of the trade and all of that, we, we know that it, they're not doing it for a sale, but only for their interest. But even in your interest, you had a backlash and you had a problem when their, their industries are falling down because they are not having the purchasing power when they go bankrupt and therefore your market diminishes and not growing so it's not in your interest as well, right? Also from the side of the government we hear the idea that, you know, um, they dropped in West uh, in Western world. We have a culture that we're going to spread. Fine, they have. You can spread your culture. It doesn't matter who is in the, who, who's who's in the government at the moment. Thirdly, uh, what they actually want to do from the closing, uh, they want to blackmail people, right? They want to take their industry when they drop down. They they can blackmail them by the by the loans that they are taking from MMF or World Bank or from the, from the USA directly. They can do that right now. We don't see any problem with that. Right? What has happened in history? They've done that. They've done that in Iraq, they've done that in Iran, and it backlashed heavily because USA supported Shahs in Iran before the Islamic Revolution. They've supported, uh, they've supported Saddam Hussein for ages, right, for decades. Even in Afghanistan, which they mentioned as their example, they're supporting Karzai for 10 years now and it still doesn't have a public support. What does that mean? That means that people backlash. People want to have their own, their, their own way. People want to have their own democracy. Especially now, when, as we've heard from the op some side of the opening opposition, when we have people who are leaking things, once the perception of very fair and arbitrary and very democratic USA goes away, because we know that they will break the direction, they will lose the position as an arbiter to have and monitor the, the fair elections all over the world, which we believe it's catastrophic, especially when we have in comparison Russia and China, right? Who can do that on the other side, right? But, 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 the, but the very more, more important thing is the, is the development of the left wing, 
right? What happened in Cuba, for instance, is that after Fidel, we have Raul. Raul allowed the internet. Raul, uh, Raul allowed, sorry, um, uh, allowed mobile phones and everything else. We have liberalization of the left wing throughout the throughout the continent, right? Why is that very important, Ashish? It's very important because the relations then and the perception of the USA is not, perce is not perceived anymore as an intruder or as in someone who wants to have a hegemony over our own culture, over our own uh, political development, rather as someone who can either help us or be our trade partner if we decide to do so, right? Venezuela as well had problems when they nationalized their oil industry, but only because the bargaining chip on the USA as one of the biggest markets in the world is way huger. So the political, so the deals that they are making in their trade-offs are not going inside of those people, right? What, no, not yet, right. What do you want, what, 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 what is the next thing that you want to talk about, right? Is that the whole development of the left wing, they're saying, oh, how come Brazil did not fall apart? Well, this is not, Brazil did not fall apart because their madam president at the moment is one of the coolest people in the world, right? They're saying, oh, when she, she sees the rebel people and people protesting on the street in the second tell, when, they, when, when she sees that, she's like, oh, fine, you should protest maybe, and you, we support all of your causes, and we're going to try to change the government. What does it say? It says that the left wing parties, the left wing throughout the continent are developing and going more liberalized, right? This is very important because it's, this is a stable way. What they're offering is intrusion, is hegemony, is neocolonialism. We don't see how that goes on their side. Also, I'll talk about Ukraine, but I'll offer you. You're putting this implicitly, this idealistic point of view where every country can meddle and develop for themselves. But what we see is actually the developing powers <laughs> superpowers who meddle in those countries, but in a different way and in a less moral way. Why don't you tackle that it's better to have one superpower, which is America, and prosper there in comparison to other possible hegemonies? There, first, firstly, we've heard from the side of the op there is not a hegemonistic world as such in, in that sense, right? Not anymore, especially not since 20 years ago. But secondly, after falling of the Berlin Wall and everything else. But the second thing that you need to know is that you've tried this. You've tried to put the hegemony in a different satellite states all over the globe. You tried it in Ukraine with Timoshenko, it backlashed, right? You tried it throughout the, throughout the globe in the different countries, it always backlashed, right? What is the stable way? Especially in the countries which are in transition, right? They have the rhetoric and the narrative in their, in their societies that the USA wants to impose its values, wants to impose free market and everything else. If this leaks ever, that narrative is only going to be enforced, right? The, 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 the dialogue that they want to, that they want to ensure and, and, and the changing of those countries and cooperation with them is only, to be, is only to be worse, right? In Peru, where they try to do that, we have 5% of people who are filthy rich and 95% who are living in slums. That's not development. It doesn't work, right? Uh, while when we compare to some different countries that Brazil, for instance, that they let so far so go, they're developing near one of the fastest growing nation in the world, right? We believe that that's fairly different. And also, why is this very important? Because the neocolonialism, as perceived, as, especially in the context of USA, is going to lose the high ground that currently USA has as someone who is spreading democracy, someone who, ha who could believe, be believed in, right? If we lose that, we are left with no arbitrary, no arbitrary body or no arbitrary agent to, to guarantee the fairness of the election, especially in the countries which are passing through transition, right? We want to get down to we want to have someone who is going to monitor our elections, only because of that we believe you should oppose. Thank you for the floor, Mr. Speaker. What we have heard, all the negative things from the side of, of, of the opposition came from one point that Theo brought to you. Because we let super, superpowers fight for interest in these regions. Because they supported, the multi, multitude of them supported who they wanted in their own interest. When we lost that one superpower, and that is the United States, we lost control, we, we let the world go down, and we let these socialist countries lead on with their politics because of the Russia, because of the China. This is why our 
two main clashes in this debate will be why we need a hegemon in this situation, especially in Latin America, why, and the second is why it is in the interest of the United States and why this debate is about that, not about stuff Milan brought to you, but we will tackle them anyway, because we have to, right? Uh, and so here we go to a um, large point of my rebuttal, so I'll be very fast. The things that have remained from the side of the opening opposition is why don't we let them economically develop by themselves in this fluffy little world? Because they never do. Because the ones who will want to fight against their governments would be either slaughtered or will run away from Cuba or they will be indoctrinated within the education, within the uh, propaganda, whatever. This never happens. When we make them economically dependent on us because we can even though they wa don't want to to cooperate with us, how? But even if we do, this is how it backlashed before on us. It backlashed on the example. It backlashed on the example of, for example, Balkans. When you let sanctions go to Serbia during the Milosevic, he gains strength. Then he says, "Look at them. They're stealing our food. They don't give us to trade. They don't let us do anything." This is how you become an enemy in their eyes. Second point of the, of the rebuttal: Latin American identity. Oh wow. So I relate to my first point of rebuttal. The Latin American identity is created without any identity being let to develop because they will either, uh, again, slaughter you or will indoctrinate you. So there isn't Latin American identity. There is a theory of fear and there's a theory of indoctrination by the propaganda. Why? Because we do not have the opposition that is created. Why don't we let the opposition create on its own? And this is a story about we create oligarchs. No. When you give them power, again happened in Serbia. When you give them, like, we'll flow in the power to the opposition, uh, ho hopefully think that the opposition will fight for their own interest on their own. What happens is then people, those oligarchs, uh, feel that they, are only that they are only dependent on the people who would vote for them. They don't feel they're dependent on anyone else. When the United States say, we placed you there, you're going to do the things we tell you to do, then you're dependent on the United States and then you have to do the things we tell you to do. This is how you have controlled oligarchs. Not the thing that happened in Russia again, right? When they feel that people support them and go and in that way uh, take their power with the uh, with the the uh, the things they are left behind from the corruption identity, whatever. Okay. Next point. Matuljak. No. Matuljak says it will leaked. People will backlash. Who backlashed when it leaked today? Where did you feel where did you feel people standing up against the United States after the WikiLeaks? Nowhere. We talk about it for a bit, then they then they say it never happened. We say yes it did. Nothing ever happened. <laughs> Nothing nowhere happened. They didn't prove that proved us that this worked. And they say even if it doesn't leak. Okay. Even if it doesn't leak, what happens is that you create even more problems and then Matuljak stands up and says, the poor people in Peru, even though you don't want to talk about it, 95% of them are in slums. Well, guess what? I hate that statistics. Only 5% are rich. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. No, the poor are getting better standards. They're still poor, but the standards are better because, the economic, because of the economic development and because of the uh, economic transaction between the United States when we control their governments, when we tell them what to do, when we put our cheap goods there. Done. Okay. Clashes. Why we need a hegemon? What was brought to you by Theo is that when we don't have direct influence of United States, we have multitude of other countries fighting for their power. This is Russia, this is China. How do they do that? Very, very sneaky, right? They say, okay, we don't have anything against Latin American states. It's fine with us, whatever they do. The countries, the governments in Latin American states feel they have support. We, standing back, say it's okay for the other hegemons to support them and let the, th the shit hit the fan, right? We do not need this. We, it is not in our interest to do, to do this. Why? Because we suffer from it. Because when we let Russia and Ukraine do, uh, Russia and China do this, then we suffer the consequences. Russia on the other side of the globe doesn't give a shit. 
Russia, on, this side, on the other side of the globe, makes new partners to cooperate with in Latin America, right? We suffer the consequences when the immigrants, the drug, the everything, the corruption, the everything you have there, um, Matulik. The biggest influx of influence of, of immigrants comes from Mexico, and that's because of your war on drugs, right? Is this debate about war on drugs? No, this debate is about corrupted governments that do not fight against drugs with their own countries. And that when you let it happen, this is how it escalates. This is the story. Second thing, why is it in the interest of the United States? It's in the interest of the United, United States because not because you want a fluffy little nice pink world. Because you don't want to suffer the bad consequences of the politics. You do not, don't want to wait for these people to eventually call you to help them. Because you will have more shit to deal with when you do that. I'm sorry for my language. Uh, and so why don't we need this? We don't need this because we need trade. We need partners. We don't have the time and the means to wait for the partners to magically, as the opening opposition say, show up themselves, right? We need this to fight the, the things, the problems that we have within our countries coming from there, within our own people basically feeling, the, the, uh, 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 getting the rhetorics that we have from there. Because all of the practical things that we're giving to you by the, closing, by the op uh, opening government and because of the principal things that we show you, because we think that multitude of hegemons does bad for the United States. Because when shit hits the fan, United States are expected to go there, intervene, whatnot. We say it is much, much better to show that you're a hegemon, do the things you have to do before you need to intervene afterwards. Thank you. So today's government is probably living in the time of Bush administration when the neocolonism of the superpower USA, which is actually invading all of the territories because it's in their best interest, they're still living in the Bush, Bush administration period. They're living in a time when Bush actually came to Latin America and stepped out of the plane and then asked, oh, those people speak Latin. And this is the government that we have today now. And that government wants to actually impose some Western values onto the world that has a long tradition of socialism, long tradition of people, the workers being involved in this whole story. And we do believe that it's probably in the best interest of America to have something neocolonistic on their side. But we don't believe this is the right time for the USA to do that. They were supposed to do that 20 or 30 years ago before the development of left wing started, before everything was changing in the terms of those former poor socialistic states. Maybe they were able to do that before. Today, the opposition will tell you what was the USA then, what's USA now, and what the USA is becoming. And the second thing the opposition will tell you is that the clash about what the left wing, uh, uh, left wing parties are becoming in the Latin America states, and why is it wrong for the USA to intervene in this matter now in this moment? But firstly, what we've heard from Selena is the fact that, um, that we need the hegemony and that the USA has to become the superpower and everything, blah, blah, blah. But it's the wrong time. Because in this moment, the USA, if it's losing credibility, they're losing credibility because they did the political things over and over again in some different territories. They were in Latin American states, but they were Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever they were con contributing to with like active political decisions they were making quite publicly. And that was the part in the USA took a lot of credit on their side to be reasonable and to say, think of themselves as somebody who's powerful enough to have the whole world between them and have the whole world which is being controlled with them. This is the moment in which USA was perceived as the bad guy, in which USA was perceived as a neocolistic giant, and in which USA was perceived as the guy who is who's not allowed to have the hegemony because we are afraid of the USA actually invading those territories and afraid of having the USA as a superpower which is intruding only what is important to them but not what is actually important and rational for the territories that are they invading. This is the moment which USA lost the credibility. And this now is just like the extension on something which will which, which, which brought with the superpower and interest of the USA on even a lower level because we saw that happening in history and we see it happening again. And it's happening in a completely wrong time which I'll explain um, uh, um, which I'll explain uh, later, yeah. 
Second thing is the fact that they are imposing the moment in which dependency of the USA is uh, being developed because the USA is putting somebody who is being controlled and the, the oligarchs are being controlled at that moment, and we tell them what to do. As I already mentioned, some of the people who are working like in the administration of the USA weren't actually aware of the fact which language is being spoken in Latin America. And we are guessing that most of the people who were those people were, will be those who are putting put on the political high positions and those who are actually being the part of the uh, organization of the internal structure of the Latin America states. Probably it will be the fact in which something which is being imposed on these people will be a new element in which the people have to cope with that, although they want they, they don't want to have that. We have uh, we had a lot of situation in which like um, Okay, we had a lot of situations in which the people wanted to continue their socialistic state, their socialistic matters. And we have on the other side, which is the construct with the opposition, what, what's the left wing becoming right now? What's happening in the moment when we just let one side of Latin America develop in the future? What happened now is the fact that we can compare Cuba to New York because New York currently has more beggars and more slams and more homeless people than Cuba actually does, which had, has actually an efficient healthcare system. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the fact that Cuba currently has this development toward liberalism because Raul came to the came to the political office and did intrude some, some principles of liberalism and tolerance to Cuba. This is the moment in which we're seeing that the left wing giant of bad ideas is actually moving towards liberalism and moving towards some of the Western ideas that the USA is trying to impose so hardly. And this is the moment in which the USA wants to do something. We don't think that's going quite well with the story about the USA hegemony, superpower, and credibility. We do believe this is the moment in which the USA is just putting the stamp and defining themselves again as a giant who doesn't give a shit about what's happening, although they're claiming that something better will be happening if they invade that territory. Selena. This is why we're talking about who is controlling the, these countries. If we let China and Russia control these countries, even if they feel the slight turn towards something more liberal slightly, we see the problem when U.S. loses its interest and loses hegemony. Right time is now because you want these countries to be connected to Okay, but the government on the other side, the horse side, is functioning on the merits that there are two or three superpowers in the world that have, have the whole territory on their hands, and they're not thinking about the fact that there are some independent moments and some independent states who maybe won't be controlled by the superpowers, but might be able to actually enter the inter intercultural or international community at some, some moments as alternative to actually being controlled by the superpower who wants to be the control freak of that state in that moment. Not, it's not necessary that it will happen, that if USA actually goes away with this story, that China will step in all the Russia was stepping. It probably won't happen. And if we're talking about the trade market, if we're talking about like opening the market from the internal structure of the state, fine, Imagine let them be. Fine, let them talk with the superpowers. Let them even have some different agreements. But don't impose the wrong side of them. Don't impose them the superpower that you believe that it's right for them. Let them be. Let them choose their superpower that they want to be collided with. Because this is the moment in which you're offering them the moment Imagine. of liberalism, moment of opening their gates, uh, instead of telling them what's right, what's wrong, and not let it, allowing them to have this great development that we're seeing uh, currently in this moment. And the second thing that is happening in the moment is the fact, but before, yeah, Ashish. So your entire case is premised on two things. One, that people will find out, and two, if they find out, it will make a big difference in the status quo. We gave you lots of reasons to believe these were true. Can you be the first to rebut them? I didn't actually understand the question, but okay. I'll probably answer you during my rebuttal or something, but okay. Um, so, okay, what I wanted to say uh, afterwards was the fact that we're talking a lot about corruption in those states and the corruption is coming from the left-wing parties and everything else. We don't see how the corruption is, is actually going away if we have controlled officers on the powers which are being controlled and corrupted by the USA who is actually financing them in that moment because in that moment we have the division of the state. Once we're pro-USA because they do believe that the Western values which are being imposed by the USA are forbid are actually protecting and supporting that moment. And we have the second thing which are the people who are not quite fond of the fact that their official is being corrupted by the outside uh, outside figure and not from the internal figure that's, that is the status quo of the states, not only of the Latin America but of the world. And we do believe that this is the moment in which the division of those interstates, the division of the states of Latin America is happening, the polarization of the society, which is not actually available to support, but then they have to be oppressed and have to have a re revolution and a resistance in order to persuade and try to protect their traditional values and what they feel as, as, as right, not what's being imposed and not what's being imposed to them to believe that it's right in that moment. And we do believe that this will backlash on both internal and USA global level and make the USA even less superpower than it is now. So for all these reasons, we beg you to oppose this motion. Thank you.